Okay, so uh, so I have added a bunch of meshes here that I kind of sort of had readily available, and uh, these are all surface meshes. Uh, one of these two femoral arteries probably has a boundary. I can't quite remember which one, and I didn't quite check as well. Uh, but there's a bunch of these meshes, and all the underscores are my kind of like reference for how many vertices they have. There, there are a bunch of spherical meshes. Each of them has different number of vertice, vertices. So it's just a quick reference for it. And I have a bunch of these meshes. So uh, part of this session is to try and do some basic processing with these meshes and it's a little bit open-ended. So some you, you are welcome to go around um, loading meshes and running some of these basic computations on any of the meshes from there. There, There is one caution that I might have to tell you, but probably not needed, we'll see. Okay, let's start by just loading this mesh for the sphere. The, so in my case, uh, I'm running the notebook from uh, this directory called demos. So uh, I just have to load the, this is therefore the path to, to my meshes. Make sure you have the correct path uh, to the mesh meshes directory, and then uh, nothing fancy. I'm just gonna change the path to the mesh every time uh, I want to load a different mesh. No GUI, click and select, and so on. Okay. So I'm gonna load this mesh. This 328 vertices. vertices. No, it's it's probably not vertices. It's 328 elements. My bad. Uh, it's 328 elements in the sphere. I'm going to load that small spherical mesh. Because I don't quite know if it's running or not. I'm going to redo this, but you don't have to. Okay. Uh, to just check if the mesh has been loaded correctly, I'm going to print the number of vertices and triangles and something is not quite right here. Maybe I mislabeled it. It's likely that I mislabeled the sphere mesh. Okay, no, no, no big deal. And I'm gonna visualize this and this is the uh for me at least in this demonstration today, this is the stickiest thing. The visualization is very basic, uses just matplotlib's 3D axes and the triserf to sort of plot it. Uh, you can't even rotate the mesh to sort of see that it's, it's you have a static view. If you want, you can adjust some uh, viewing specs. You could change the elevation, the azimuthal angle, and you can slightly adjust these uh, viewing location. But this is very basic, okay? So again, um, my intention is to convince you that you could use the Laplace Beltrami and do this quick and dirty demonstration. But in practice, hopefully you've learned a little bit of LibIGL on Thursday or Friday, and maybe Thursday and Friday. Um, and maybe you would learn a little bit of some other, you might have learned a bit of some other um, graphics library, and you should be able to use something that you're, that is a bit more serious for actual processing, okay? Okay, so that's the mesh of the sphere and go ahead and try that you can load the torus and the other meshes. Okay, so I just live debugged something or uh, I have I was incorrectly printing the size which. Uh, is not what we wanted. We want to print the shape and indeed each of them is labeled by the number of elements in it. So um, hopefully you have had a chance to load some of these meshes. So I, I mean, I would keep this a bit slower pace than this morning. And uh, so let me know once you're done with notebook one. Maybe one or two things I can point out. Nothing 
fantastic, but just basic ID things that um, there's one yet another mesh storage format that we use here. Um, you might have learned about other formats, but um, in this, I just use a very quote unquote uh, naive and a very plain vanilla format where I have the vertices store the locations of the vertices of the mesh uh, and triangles contains the connectivity. of the mesh vertices. So I assume that uh, all elements are of the same type, nothing, no mixed elements, all, all elements are triangles in these meshes. Um, so enough to specify their connectivity. And maybe we can look at a few of these. So these are a bunch of vertices and of this is perhaps for the femoral artery um, and a couple of just viewing the first 20 triangles. So the triangles are all uh, just connectivity and the indexing for these vertices is assumed to start from zero. So that's the zeroth index and triangles therefore have some zero index vertices popping up. Okay, nothing fancy, normal, small, like a very straightforward mesh format. So the only caution I was going to suggest is that it is possible that one or two of these meshes have triangles uh, indexed from one. They might be one or two. Uh, I think I've sat down and changed all my meshes to have index indexing start from zero, but watch out so sometimes this this uh, anything like setting up the laplacian or something might fail and if it fails one quick check to do is to see what is the indexing here so you might want to do something like uh, ravel it and then take them in and in this case it's zero in all of these meshes i've checked it's zero but there could be a mesh there. If it is, if this is one, that could be the reason why uh, setting up the Laplacian could be failing. Okay. So these triangles are expected to be integers. So, yeah, I mean, the connectivity that is, is expected to contain only integers for the library. So it's better to specify the D type to be in when loading the mesh. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll wait another, it's till four, 240 to for you to play around with this notebook try loading some other meshes and visualizing them you might want to change the parameters of this visualization maybe change the coloring scheme or shading i mean there isn't too much to play around and i here i'm assuming that um, everyone has some basic python 3 uh, on knowledge so you should be able to play around with it So we'll, I'll wait till for another four minutes before we go, go to the second notebook. But in the interim, if you have questions or want to share some thought or any follow up on the lecture or even this notebook, please let know. So Kaushik, the yes. last, last mesh, uh, does it have a boundary? Uh, yeah, one of the two femoral arteries has a boundary. I think this one does have a boundary. Right. Okay. But it that shouldn't be an issue as far as creating Laplacians on it is. Ghosts, uh, right. it's just probably not a watertight or mesh or something right. like that. Sure. At least since this very crude visualization, I can already see that boundary there. Okay, I have a 
quick question which may no, uh, slightly be out of you can say what uh, we discussed in the morning so uh, mm -hmm. you were talking about boundaries so there were uh, there could be other problems where uh, there are like uh, we have intermediate values given and then some of the boundaries are not described so it is partially well posed or something of that sort so uh, does the exterior calculus approach work in those cases as in does that stencil fit in uh partial okay so partial boundary information for a pd is given you mean yeah um like one like boundary what... is given and uh, if the other one is like incompletely described then we have some intermediate values instead something of that okay so. i'm uh, so is it, okay assuming it's a two dimensional domain let's fix that not 1d so you're saying part of the boundary some values are given but the and rest some information is missing yeah and uh, there is some compensatory information in terms of like uh, some other areas where the values are getting fixed like a dirish lane between the uh, inside the domain itself but it is not a boundary. Um, so, um, in in such okay, such problems can be a problem. Uh, so, when when you say that there there could be interface values, there could be regions within the domain where you you are forced to specify values, or you're given values based on whatever yeah. problem you're solving. Uh, so this this has not, nothing to do with exterior calculus per se. This is more classically just a question about is such a problem well posed as far as PDs are concerned. And um, so I'm going to slightly throw my hands up here because so I'm, I mean, I, I, I know there are probably other people who are more of more expertise in this. Uh, for instance, okay. there are um, cracks. There are problems with cracks in uh, domains. Uh, uh, mechanical. Okay, I'll tell you my specific problem in that sense. Okay, it uh -huh. is like say if we have the heat equation in uh, polar coordinates. Yeah. So there, what happens is we have a singularity, which we usually, as numerical folks, we don't really handle that well. So we create a pseudo boundary around that singularity and we say we are going to like, instead of taking a disc, we are going to take just a donut or something of that sort. Okay. Pseudo donut sort of. Uh, you mean on a disc, you, you, you puncture the hole or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because that hole actually is a singularity when it comes to the heat equation. Uh, only because you chose the wrong coordinates in some sense. It's a coordinate singularity, not really a heat equation singularity. Okay. Uh, so that 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 sort of a there are there are problems with singularities in the solution itself. That's different kind of singularity, and that finite element exterior calculus can handle. But if you're like, for instance, you 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 take. Um, spherical coordinates and try do, doing a problem on a sphere, you're going to end up with a singularity at, at the North Pole and the South Pole. Like in this case, it's something is going to be not well defined. Uh, but yeah. you could get away with it by putting so-called coordinate charts. You put two charts on the sphere and the singularity kind of doesn't, you, you have to do some stereographic transformations uh, or you might have to put more charts and not do stereographic projection. There are ways to working around it, but it's not an intrinsic to the PD sort of a problem. There are such problems. Okay. So cracks was one thing, but you don't even need a crack. It's a very com common textbook problem called reentrant corner. You, you have okay. like an L shaped domain. If you are a MATLAB person, the MATLAB logo for almost a decade yeah. or two has been the reentrant corner problem. Okay. So, so yeah, so those you can handle those you, you have to take care of how you do the approximation spaces, but these kinds of problems, I don't know if there's like a one 
solution that fits all kind of an approach. Okay. And maybe maybe people do it. I just don't know. I'm not familiar with such work. Okay. Okay, um, we are we are a bit past it. So hopefully everyone had no issues with the first getting started notebook, which means we can move on to the second notebook. Okay, so in this we are going to set up the Laplace Beltrami on at least one mesh. You you are welcome to. Then it's open ended. You're welcome to try setting it up on a few more meshes and we'll see. Um, what we can do with it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to hear my output. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just do this inputs. I'm going to load the sphere and. And uh, this, this external package has a sub module called try mesh from which there is a, a function called try mesh that you load and you can pass try mesh i think it's probably an object you can pass it the triangles and vertices that you have loaded and it'll set up an object called, you can name it whatever you want i've called it tm and one of the methods for this object is a laplace matrix and one of the choices for the Laplacian matrix is to set up the cotangent Laplacian. You have to say mode equal to half cotangent. Uh, remember in today morning's discussion, there was a factor of half in the cotangent. It was half of cotan alpha plus beta. So that's where the half cotangent terminology comes from. And so you should be able to try setting this up and see what sort of a matrix it sets up. So this one sets up a, this is a, it's not such a reasonable thing, but uh, it sets up a matrix, which is really a numpy array, although most of the, many of the entries or most of the entries are going to be zero. It would be a better idea to set it up as a sparse matrix, but it's okay. We'll, we'll deal with this for the moment. So it's this package returns a Laplacian matrix, which does have the correct, uh, pattern that we expect it would have. This is its sparsity. Uh, it's kind of diagonal. Okay. I mean, there are other things because this is a sphere, not exactly a flat domain, but yeah, there's an essentially a banded structure. So you're welcome to keep reading on and uh, you don't have to wait for me, but I'm going to wait here for a few minutes to try and see everyone has caught up up to this. So this morning I was kind of saying this, uh, I'll put it in the updated presentation when I put in links, but there are some really nice, uh, you could use the discussion from today as a base board and uh, use that to look for some sophisticated and even really well done lectures on on uh, discrete differential geometry encompassing the laplace beltrami and its discretization for instance yeah so one thing i was talking about this morning was kiran crane's uh, discrete differential geometry notes uh, which covers amongst other things the Laplace Beltrami and does so in a very nice way. Um, so where is the latest? Okay, here it is. So you 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 search for Keenan Crane. I'll put it in the in the slides, of course. But if you want to go for it now or soon enough, you can try Keenan Crane discrete differential geometry.
and you, this is a pretty large document, I think maybe a hundred odd pages, maybe. Uh, yeah, so there are many interesting things here. Um, there's the Poisson equation, discretization via FEM via tech, and other discrete differential geometry things, which we couldn't talk about, or it wasn't part of our agenda anyways. So those are things maybe you could you could relate it with the with the things you have sort of seen in this course so far. Some of them at least. Okay, so that's one place I wanted one reference I wanted to point you to. The other one I want to point you to is uh, uh, so there is a course in ETH Zurich on surface processing, surface mesh processing. I'm blanking a little bit on the name of the course. Uh, Laplace surface, no. Uh, yeah, probably it was this digital geometry processing. No, shape modeling and, oh, it's also called shape modeling and geometry processing. So this is another useful um, reference notes for for some of this. I mean, this is from 2021. The version I knew of was uh, the 2018 version that I was thinking about, but uh, there are certain things here which are complementary to what I talked about. Uh, let's see if they have something on. I think they have, okay, they don't have anything in this edition. Oops, on Laplacians, the, the 2018 edition of this course had some, some stuff. So the thing I should search for is shape modeling. Twenty eighteen. Yeah, this twenty eighteen version of the course. And you can find like this there's a chapter on the Laplacian. There's some chapter on deformation. In fact, okay, we'll see. So this is kind of different from what I mean, but it, it uses so that the Cotan formula is derived in this thing. It's a uh, to be slightly honest, this derivation is a bit involved and there are easier ways to stating it, but perhaps because they are going to give you his, the, the gory details behind all the background needed to deriving this Cotan formula. So the Laplace Shin Cotan is defined in this. Uh, you can take a look. Um, but more interestingly, uh, you can look at some of these uh, remeshing, smoothing as application examples for things we learn today. So th this is essentially, okay, this initial part is all about what good meshes are. If I remember correctly, one of them has uh, Laplacian based. Okay, not this, perhaps the deformation one has. Yeah, so there's smoothing by flowing. We, we want the notebook three is also a little bit of smoothing by flowing, but uh, this contains more information which you can try try to use or reproduce some of these computations on your own. Okay, we are going. Uh, so th this has it for curves and surfaces. Then there's some. In fact, one of the, the third exercise we'll use this, but. There are more examples that that you should kind of look here. For instance, this is Desbrun et al. Uh, their implicit fairing paper from SIGGRAPH 99, way back, I think. Um, and then there's some smoothing. We are solving an optimization problem, uh, which ends up, the, this their notation is a bit weird, but this is the Laplace Beltrami. This is the mass matrix both of which you have access to via Swarapi or IGL or some other library. Uh, and when they say L, this is just the Laplace Beltrami with some mass inverse appended to it. 
Okay, you can, I don't have the, these are standard meshes, but I don't have the, the meshes for this uh, armadillo and so on, but you could, you could use this setup and try experimenting it on your own uh, at your leisure later on. Okay, so those are some, some of those, these links I will add in the updated uh, slides as a list of other additional material you can go look up. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's do one other problem. <laughs> Let me uh, talk a little bit of theory, although this is really a demonstration session. I couldn't talk about eigenvalue problems at all in the, in the main theory. So, um, and Laplace Beltrami eigen functions are used as Fourier basis functions in graph uh, in, in graphics processing. So it's kind of an important thing. So I didn't want to not talk about it at all. So let's talk about this problem. So in, in linear algebra, perhaps you, you already learned this week or know from earlier that this problem is called as the Lapl is called as the eigenvalue problem. So where, uh, oops, I shouldn't have done that where you have uh, a matrix times a vector equals the scaling of the vector. Okay, so in if this is on real domain, if, if the field, if the vector fields field as uh, vector spaces field is real, then this problem is essentially one of scaling the eigenvector. Um, and so the the Laplace Laplace belt, if you pick the Laplace belt Rami to be this this matrix, we can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors corresponding to the Laplace Beltrami, uh, which in turn tells you something about the about the base space. I mean, you can use this is a separate linear. This is, this has nothing to do with linear Laplace Laplacians and its discretizations. Just within the purview, within the realm of linear algebra, um, the eigen if, if A is a symmetric matrix, all its eigenvalues are real. And, um, and if in addition, somehow the eigenvalues are distinct, the eigenvectors form an orthogonal basis. Okay, if not, at least the eigenvectors will form an independent set. And you could therefore con conceivably think of using the eigenvectors of a matrix, of a symmetric matrix um, as, as, a basis for Rn uh, for whatever purpose that you might want to use a basis for it. Uh, the symmetric is a little bit important because uh, symmetry guarantees that the it's, symmetry is a necessary condition if you want for the eigenspaces to not be um, degenerate. And so the, the algebraic and geometric multiplicities are the same. Uh, it, and so, so at least for symmetric matrices, we can say something about using the eigenvectors as an independent basis for the space. Um, so in, in the smooth setting, the eigenvectors of this problem would be really eigenfunctions. And you have a similar theory, which says that for a self-adjoint uh, linear differential operator or partial differential operator, the eigenfunctions of that operator or a basis for the space of functions, the space of functions here being the space of uh, uh, C2 functions at least, because you're applying an eigen, like a Laplacian onto the functions. So this um, is the, therefore the linear algebra or the finite dimensional equivalent of it. Finding the basis for, sorry, finding the eigen basis for this Laplace Beltrami would help us in using those bases as, as so using those eigenvectors as a basis. Okay. So I'm going to therefore use the linear dense linear algebra package and compute the eigenvalues of this matrix, which has already been anyways uh, specified as a as a dense matrix, okay. This computation is just takes a fraction of a second on my computer at least. And, and then I'm going, this is just a bunch, some, some visualization of uh, these eigenfunctions. And since this is on this sphere, 
So these are eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami on the sphere, and those are the so-called spherical harmonics, um, which are again themselves they have had their use and they're probably still used. Okay, the this is in in increasing order. This is the eigenfunction corresponding to the first eigenvalue, and you can compute it and check and check what the eigenvalues are. Uh, so the, the, those are all the eigenvalues for this problem. You notice that the first eigenvalue is close to zero. So the Laplacian is really a semi-definite operator. It's all the eigenvalues are positive, which is what you would expect because uh, it's a it's a symmetric uh, mate. All the eigenvalues are real, which is because it's symmetric, but all the eigenvalues are also positive because the Laplacian, the smooth Laplacian is a self-adjoint operator. But one of its eigenvalues is zero, and this has one of this was one of the things I referenced. This has to do with how many components there are in your domain. If your domain consists of a sphere as is multi-componented, which means it has a sphere and maybe a torus or something like that, the torus sphere is in, in sitting in the space in between the torus, then your eigenvalues would be would reflect on how many components it has. So at least the scalar Laplace, at least the Laplace Beltrami's eigenvalues, the zero eigenvalues tells you how many components there are in your in your domain on which the Laplace Beltrami is defined. The corresponding eigen function or eigen vector is just the constant vector. So you can see this is kind of you can't rotate it, but you'll have to believe that it's a constant vector. And then these are some of the other uh, these are some of the other spherical harmonics. So it's an exercise, or you can try it now. You can try loading and computing the eigenvectors and eigenvalues for some of the other meshes if you wish. But caution, you might have to uh, use the, the sparse library. So maybe I will just add a few here, and maybe I'll submit this notebook again to the to the Google Drive. Um, just a quick refresher in case you, you haven't used the sparse library. I have already loaded uh, scipy.sparse as SPRS, and I'm going to set this up as a sparse matrix. So I can just say SPRS dot, there are many formats um, that are available up for sparse matrices. This just is the, so-called um, column column major row format, and now now you notice that L L is set up as a sparse matrix, and you can then use sparse the sparse linear algebra tools. Uh, dot ix h I think. Okay, my pen. So I am generally not a notebook person, so I'll have to. I like IPython's uh, terminal interface because I can do things like more than convenience and comfort, or like more than like just being familiar with it. Uh, I can quickly check what is available. So. Okay, maybe I should do from scipy dot sparse. Okay. okay, so there is uh, at least I can see it's ixh. So I'm going to compute some evals and e vectors um, using using ixh for this sparse matrix. 
and I can tell it how many eigenvalues I want. I can compute 10 of them, and then I can say, like, I want the smallest magnitude. Okay, so there is, this is not working. Mm -hmm. What attribute error? I see. Okay, and then it finished computing these. And you can notice that I'll let you do the <laughs> analysis. This is this negative is a round off error. It's really zero, and you can compare which ones generated. Um, how closely do the dense and the sparse solvers eigenvalues compare with each other? So I would just have this as a Okay, so in case you want to play around with those uh, sparse linear eigen solvers, you can go for it later. I've updated the, the Google Drive. Okay, let's now go to the, maybe I'll wait another four or five minutes and then we can go to the last notebook that I have for today.
all right let's now move on to the last notebook i have which provides us some smoothing example using the laplace bell drumming and let me import the modules okay i'm going to use the femoral arteries mesh to try and see if i can do any smoothing on it whatever i can <clears throat> and so on meshes smoothing can be thought of I, uh, as far as i know is a as a heat diffusion problem although i think i know of at least one other slight different variation of this theme and maybe graphics people do lots of different variations on this uh, flow theme to to do smoothing there are probably a bunch of methods and uh, i don't proclaim myself to be an expert in those methods uh, so you, you can always find out or like maybe like people will, will know uh, other techniques that involve the laplacian but is beyond just this basic heat flow uh, heat equation like smoothing problem okay so the the problem the basic textbook smoothing problem is that okay i i move the vertices of the mesh uh, i think of it as heat that is flowing and so i solve the heat equation with the vertices of the mesh and with the laplacian of course because the heat equation involves the laplacian and here I've already slightly uh, corrupted my notation and I'm saying L is really the, the discrete Laplacian here, but think of this as coming from a smooth problem and I'm, uh, uh, I am discretizing it and obtaining the scale like the Laplace Beltrami here. And I can discretize this using the forward or backward quotient. One of them will yield a, uh implicit method and the other will yield an explicit method so for for the backward difference i would end up solving a linear system every time and for forward difference i'm just going to do matrix vector multiplications over here i'm doing the easier version which is uh, matrix vector multiplication i've set it set up the discretization of this pro um, the the d by dt of the vertices is using um forward difference yeah so backward would imply i have to solve a linear system okay so here is some here is the femoral artery mesh i just did something okay and i'm going to try and do a couple i want to do 10 steps of smoothing but let me start with at least one step and let's see if i can I, I have some arbitrary choice of parameters. Lambda is 0.1. I'm going to take a time step of 0 0.01. That's the step size for the discretization of the d by dt term. And uh, and I'm I'm trying to be a bit careful in setting this uh, problem up. So if I if I did the the back the the forward oil, the forward difference method, I would end up getting like a lambda L. Yeah, go on. So I, okay, if not, I'll, let me just quickly finish. So I would get a matrix, which is like lambda DT L plus I into the vertices. So I'm just trying to be cautious here and changing the L from a, from a dense array to a sparse matrix. And I'm setting up a identity matrix, which is also sparse. Okay, and then I want to try doing one step of it to see if this indeed works. Um, okay, so one step was no problem. Um, okay, there is a small error here i have to set this up otherwise it's going to do nothing okay so now if i do that one step wasn't a problem let me try five steps and that went through pretty quickly as well so let me go ahead and try 10 steps Kashi, and shouldn't then, the yeah. first line on the left hand side should have an index one instead of zero all ah, right thank you yeah Thanks, thank you, Aditya. No, no. Uh, Here too, it was two. I think this this is one, and I don't know where else did you mean? 
No, so uh, first line, the index should have been one, isn't it? Because on the right hand side, you are taking v zero, and you are using v zero to get v one. I'm assuming that. And so this is the x coordinate that is being flown. Then oh, okay. this is the y. Okay. Okay. Then. Yeah, and the z coordinate. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then if I plot it, uh, unfortunately, this is bad. So that, okay, it's probably gone to zero because the the smoothing problem sort of collapses your mesh down. So you don't want to do too many steps of the smoothing. Maybe two steps and visualize what happens. Yeah, two steps, it's fine. Maybe if I did five steps. It's already, okay, it's already gone. This is some small value. So usually with this heat equation smoothing, my understanding is people do some number of steps of smoothing. Uh, and I don't, this mesh was quite reasonable to begin with itself. So smoothing is not gonna really do much, but, but this is again, the intent is like not to give you a noisy mesh too, so that you can smooth, which you could sort of set up on your own, but to quote unquote, expose you to this idea that you can use uh, Laplace Beltrami to perform a heat equation like smoothing of the vertices of a mesh. Okay. So you could you could try this with other other meshes in the problem. And my one little homework for you. Uh, you're welcome to try other problems as well, but one little homework is uh, I will, I'll update the file here. So I'm going to say here, we'll, we are going to use uh, forward oil, uh, forward differencing, but for the dv by dt, but I want you to use the backward differencing, the backward quotient. I mean, I keep saying uh, forward oil or backward oil because that's what it's really called, but uh, that's not language we, we have used. So I should say forward quotient and backward quotient. So I'm going to say uh, we can discretize the time derivative using either the forward quotient or the backward quotient. Uh, and maybe for my own sake, I'll say these correspond to the forward Euler and backward Euler methods for one time derivative ODEs. So I think Vignesh was asking me about some stability, but here is the the forward quotient is in time is not a stable discretization. So you have to take small, small, small enough time steps or time, uh, yeah, steps. We did, I did use time step, but the backward quotient is unconditionally stable with when you time, when you discretize a time derivative like this. So, um, So as an exercise, you can. Would this be a good time to talk about CFL criterion for your? Sure, we can talk about it. Yes, maybe in 30 seconds, we can talk about it. Exercise slash homework. Uh, please try smoothing all meshes 
using both forward and backward quotients. All right, so I'm going to put this as well into the Okay, so the Google Drive is updated and yeah, go for it. CFL condition. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I was asking, is this the context where it appears? Ah, not for the heat equation. No, the CFL condition appears for uh, in the in the in the note I talked about the advection equation for the that's a transport equation. It's a one D first order in time, first order in space PD. Uh, some would say that's one of the simplest first PDs that you could encounter. That's the most simplest PD, and it's. In that context, and in the con, so the, the advection equation is also a wave equation. So this is something that's important for wave equations, uh, which are not so-called conservative systems. Uh, they are they are not in steady state. They are not dissipating, and in in such problems, there is a important criteria called the courant friedrich levy criterion for finite difference like discretizations which sort of um, constrains how your spatial and time derivative can can be chosen. So in, in, in the examples, in, in, in the 2D example for finite difference for the Laplacian, I just said delta X and delta Y can be equal, can be anything, can, can differ from one point to another. Uh, you don't have that luxury when you have a PD with time also being one of the independent variables like an advection equation or a wave equation. It's okay. not a problem for the heat equation. So there is no Quran. Uh, not okay. no if, uh, if it was in the Poisson format, then it would be a problem. No, if, if it's a, if it's so the, the Quran Friedrich, the CFL condition tells you, you can't arbitrarily choose time steps in and spatial steps. There's a there's a there's a relationship between them. Yeah, there's a ratio something that they used to do. Right, and uh, so for Poisson, there is anyways no time. It's a it's a time independent PD, so it doesn't it is not even a concept for PD uh, for Poisson. Okay, okay, but that's a sub, so that's for the smooth some uh, okay that's for the problem, but. Uh, in addition, your algorithm choice of method can also screw up your computation. Uh, and that's what this stable, unstable business means. Um, again, to talk about it would require, you can like, there were many, many such concepts that kept, kept popping up where it will take more to, more time to spend on those topics to get a further understanding of it. So I, I, I would urge you to please go look up other material in addition to the, the to the references that I intend to put up. Google around or ask around and try and get a this this one was really a very breadth first search type presentation today or a module. You can go very deep into many, many of those aspects. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so you folks, I hope you were able to at least <clears throat> run the code as this. Mm. If you if you're experimenting with some other meshes, go for it and I'll hang around and if you have something to report or share. Let me know.